In the middle of April of 2011, Emmanuel Tenier was worried about his best friend. Xavier Dupont de Ligonnès had been struggling with money for several years, and recently his family had vanished from their rented home. It wouldn't be long before the family was found and it was clear that they had an encounter with someone sinister. On April 8, 2011, Emmanuel had received some strange letters from Xavier that had tried to explain why he'd been acting so odd. There were two letters dropped in Emmanuel's mailbox, one that was a copied typed letter with general greetings, and one that was personalized just for him. The letter that was not addressed to him had actually been sent out to eight of Xavier's other close personal friends and family members and contained some shocking revelations. The letter read, quote, Hi everyone, mega surprise. We've left suddenly for the USA in special circumstances that we'll explain below. The letter went on to explain that Xavier and his family would not be able to return to their home country of France or be contacted for quite some time. He said that he'd been secretly working as a spy for the US government, specifically the DEA, and that his assignment was up. He had to testify in a trial in the US about international drug trafficking. Because of that, the American government was going to hide him and his family during the trial, and give them new identities afterward. Xavier explained that as far as anyone else knew, he was moving to Australia as his job urgently needed him there. The revelation that Xavier was a spy for the US government was an extraordinary claim, bordering on unbelievable. Some of his friends and family were skeptical, but he was an extraordinary man and stranger things had happened. Xavier lived in Nantes, the sixth largest city in France, and just a short drive to the coast, a world away from the U.S., but he had spent a great deal of his youth in the U.S. with another close friend named Michel Retief, so he knew the country well. The two had wandered America for a time, making money with an import scheme they'd concocted to dodge taxes and bring expensive cars back to France using some questionable legal methods. Xavier had a past in America, and he'd been tangentially involved in crime, so perhaps his story had a degree of plausibility. Xavier had given up on his import dealings during a trip home to Versailles in 1989 when he ran into an old flame named Agnes. She was pregnant, and apparently her lover had abandoned her. Xavier and Agnes had originally met back in high school and got engaged just a few years after graduating. However, the engagement fell apart when Xavier had a fling with a girl he met on vacation, and he decided he wasn't ready to settle down. But that was years ago, and he thought he might finally be ready to have a family. Xavier and Agnes both came from old aristocracy, so Agnes being a single mother was enough to scandalize her in the eyes of her family. Xavier decided he needed to swoop in and be a hero, and offered to help raise her baby once it was born. The Dupont de Ligonnès family can be traced back to the 1500s. They still had a coat of arms, a gold helmet with three silver stars, and Xavier was technically a count. Amongst their ancestors were writers, politicians, and civil rights activists. Arthur was born in July of 1990, and Xavier and Agnes officially got married in the fall of 1991. They soon left Versailles for more affordable pastures and settled in Var, a region near the Mediterranean coast in the south. They had three more children together, Thomas, Anne, and Benoit, and Xavier legally adopted Arthur. Eventually, they moved back north and settled in Nantes. It was a bit unclear to those around them what exactly Xavier did for a living. Some people thought he worked importing wood, others thought he worked selling ad space. He claimed to earn five figures a month. The kids went to an expensive private Catholic school and the whole family collected art and had an interest in classical music and literature. Agnes taught church school and did a lot of volunteer work. In 2011, Arthur was 20 and studying engineering in college. Thomas had just begun his college experience at 18. Anne was only 16, yet already being scouted as a model. Benoit was just 13, but getting good grades and a very sweet young man, according to friends and family. 
The idea that the children would have had to stop their lives and relocate had left a lot of questions with their friends and family. Emmanuel dropped by the Dupont de Ligonnès family home on April 9th but found the spare key gone from its usual hiding spot. He went by the next day and the key was back, indicating that perhaps Xavier had not quite left for the United States just yet, as someone had placed the key there in the night. Inside the house, it did seem as if the family had vanished. The sheets were taken off the beds, dishes had been run and the fridge cleared out, as if they were going on vacation. But there were guitars out in the living room and a game of chess stopped in the middle to indicate the departure had been hasty. The mop in the kitchen was still damp. Emmanuel contacted the other friends and family members who'd received the strange letters to relay his findings and get their opinions of whether everything Xavier said could be plausible. It turned out that Xavier had told the school Agnes volunteered at that she would be out for a while as she'd been hospitalized with gastroenteritis. Shortly after, they received a note saying she was resigning her position as the family was moving to Australia. On April 11th, the high school that Benoit and Anne attended got a letter with the same story about relocation, along with a check that covered the school's fees for the rest of the year. Their lease expired shortly after they vanished, and they'd settled all outstanding bills. Friends and family would all receive follow-up texts and messages to things they'd sent recently, but the wording of the responses was strange, and by the end of the second week of April, the replies had dropped off without warning. Neighbors who were used to hearing music and laughter come from the house noticed the lack of usual activity. On April 13th, a neighbor called the police for a welfare check. When officers arrived, they found that someone had taped cardboard over the letterbox on the front door that said, quote, Please return mail to sender. Thank you. Police decided to enter the house a few days later after the family still hadn't shown up. They noticed the missing clothes and the empty picture frames and noted it looked at first glance like the family had left together. Agnes had sleep apnea and police saw that her equipment had shut off at 3.27 a.m. the morning of April 4th. Xavier had left a note on where to return the equipment. On April 21st, police started to look in the garden. Under the terrace, police noticed a piece of plywood covering a hole filled with trash. Inside the hole, they found gardening tools, a dog bowl, and couch cushions. Underneath was freshly dug dirt on top of a layer of cement. Police broke the cement easily as it had been freshly mixed and spread very thin. Underneath, they found wallpaper and a thick layer of plastic. As they started to dig further, they noticed the smell of decomposition. They found a leg first, wrapped in a blue comforter. Then, carefully but quickly, they excavated the rest of the terrace below the house. What they found was the stuff of nightmares. It was a mass grave. Several bodies had been dismembered and rolled in lime in an attempt to hide the smell of decay from both the neighbors and cadaver dogs. Both of the family's dogs were in the grave, along with five bodies that would quickly be identified. All of the bodies were wrapped in bedding, plastic, and burlap sacks. Agnes had been buried wearing several of her favorite jewelry pieces. Bundled up with her was a small wooden carving of a dove and a cross. Arthur had been buried with a statue of the Virgin Mary. Anne had her severed arms crossed on her stomach. Benoit had been buried with a metal cross and pearl jewelry. Thomas had been buried lying on his back with his arms folded across his chest and a rosary next to his head. Thrown in with the bodies were a lighter and a candle. There was also the smell of alcohol, as if a bottle had been poured out for the dead. Inside the house, analysis showed that blood had been cleaned up from the kitchen floor, which was likely where the bodies were cut apart and bundled for burial. Though the floor had been cleaned, whoever killed them missed a few droplets on the chair and table legs. The blood was later identified as belonging to Agnes and Thomas. They found rifle casings in the front of Benoit's desk and blood on Arthur's mattress. Agnes, Anne, and Arthur were all shot twice in the head. Benoit was shot three times in the head and twice in the chest. Thomas was shot twice in the head and once in the chest. Lormatazepam, a type of sleeping pill, was found in the blood work of all of the children, but not Agnes. 
When news first broke, the public couldn't believe that a well-off and seemingly loving family would come apart so tragically. But like any family, the Dupont de Ligonezes had secrets, and Xavier had the most bizarre secrets of them all. As a child, Xavier's father would allow him 10 seconds at the end of every day to speak with him on casual matters. Xavier would later joke about that and say it helped him learn brevity. But his father, Hubert, was not a good man. Hubert eventually ran off with a mistress, leaving Xavier to try to support his mother and his sisters, Veronique and Christine. An emotionally distant father can certainly damage a child, but if we're going to point fingers, the bulk of whatever psychological damage was done to Xavier as a child was likely inflicted at the hands of his mother, Genevieve. The Dupont de Ligonis family had always been religious, and the more recent generations were devout Catholics. Genevieve, however, started to believe that the Catholic Church was becoming corrupted by the devil himself, and decided to tell the world about her beliefs. In 1973, she published a collection of her beliefs and garnered about 20 followers from the fringes of aristocracy around Versailles. She told them that the apocalypse was coming and that they alone would be chosen to escape it and live in the new world that would come after. She decided to name her group Philadelphia and started calling it a closed prayer group. Over the next two decades, Genevieve claimed she received divine words from God that she would transcribe during automatic writing sessions. Genevieve paid for the cult's various expenses with her family money and even sold a few vacation properties. But the family fortune that had been building for centuries was slowly running out. Jean de Sacy was one of the early followers of Philadelphia and eventually started providing Genevieve with housing and paying all of her bills. That stabilized the family's situation and took some pressure off of Xavier. Xavier and his sisters were all very young when that all began, and essentially grew up in the cult. Christine was a young woman when the cult began and was burdened with a great destiny by her mother. Genevieve prophesied that Christine would give birth to a child whom she had dubbed the Savior. Apparently, this child would be a mix of Jesus and Satan and would bring about the apocalypse. Things were strange but stable for nearly two decades in the cult. However, in December of 1994, Genevieve said she was receiving messages from God that the apocalypse was imminent. She told her followers to meet at the de Sacy family home, a historic sprawling estate in the countryside. Jean had been stocking one room in the estate from floor to ceiling with canned goods and separated the power so it could run for at least a short time on its own oil supply. Everyone arrived at the estate, but for some reason, Genevieve didn't arrive at the same time as everyone else. Instead, she sent Christine, who was 29 by then. When the sun set, Christine claimed that Genevieve had told her that to bring about the apocalypse, they first had to plant the Savior in her womb. Christine said that all of the men present needed to sleep with her to create the child, some of whom were married to other members. Still, they participated anyway, because who were they to question the good word of God? When everyone woke up the next morning and the apocalypse didn't happen, some of the members began to finally open their eyes. They realized they were actually in a cult and left. After that, things settled down for a bit, though the cult never truly died off. Perhaps the second most interesting aspect of Xavier's private life, because nothing can top growing up in a doomsday cult, was his marriage and all of the strange ups and downs that would later come out. Xavier was not the successful businessman he presented to be and it had taken a serious toll on his and Agnes' relationship. Agnes had gotten a considerable inheritance in the early 2000s and she ended up using a great deal of it to keep the family afloat when Xavier's various businesses were failing. In 2005, Agnes had just 46,000 of her original 350,000 euro inheritance. Agnes lost nearly 50 pounds from the stress. One day, she broke down and started crying in the middle of the grocery store, and a few friends helped her decide that maybe it was time to end things with Xavier. They separated in 2005, and Xavier wrote bizarre letters to their family and friends explaining why they separated. He talked in detail about their budget and blamed Agnes for their financial difficulties. He mentioned his heroic act of adopting Arthur, which he would apparently frequently lord over her. He also pitched his latest business plan and why it was a sound investment. 
After being separated for three months, the two reconciled. After that, Agnes sent an apology letter to family and friends about anything bad she might have said about Xavier during the separation. The letter explained she had friends who were a bad influence and encouraged her to act out. Unsurprisingly, things started to fall apart again as the new year rolled around. Apparently, at the start of 2006, Xavier started to suspect Agnes was having an affair. He confronted her and she confessed that she and Michelle Retief, one of Xavier's best friends, were having an emotional affair, but she insisted they had never become physically intimate. Xavier decided to escalate things, but not in the way one might expect. He promptly went to Michelle's house and, shockingly, asked if he wanted to share Agnes with him. That kicked off a group affair with a two-day sex marathon at a hotel. They continued having numerous threesomes at various hotels, and Xavier even made a sex tape. Those encounters would eventually fizzle out, but a few years later in 2009, it would be Xavier who would be unfaithful. Near the beginning of the year, Xavier reached out to the woman who'd been his first kiss as a young man, Catherine. Catherine is mostly only identified by her first name in French media to minimize backlash after the story broke. She actually had to go into hiding for a time. Xavier reconnected with Catherine in February of 2009. It wasn't long before he told Catherine he needed 50,000 euros to get his latest business venture off the ground. Catherine owned her own business and was quite well off, so she pitched his idea to her accountants. They told her it was a bad idea, but she wrote him a check anyway, with the contractual obligation that he would pay back her investment before the end of the following year. Less than six months later, the money was gone. Xavier never had any intention of using the money to start a business. Apparently, for several years, Xavier had been running his own personal Ponzi scheme. He would take out loans to pay off family and then borrow from friends to pay off loans, essentially just swapping around and multiplying his debt. He thought he'd found a way out in Catherine as he assumed he could charm her out of needing to repay the money. Xavier told her he didn't intend to pay her back, at least not fully and certainly not by the agreed-upon time. He told her he'd used the loan to pay off other debts and tried to tell her she didn't really need the money with how rich she was. Catherine was not charmed. She promptly started legal proceedings to get the money back. Xavier started spiraling after that. He openly said he would have to kill his whole family to repay the debt and told Catherine exactly that. He wrote notes to both Michelle and Emmanuel saying that if he did not find a way out of the debt, he would be faced with the choice between, quote, suicide or collective suicide. He also openly said that he was thinking about, quote, shooting up the house while everyone is sleeping. When his father died of a heart attack on January 29, 2011, Xavier drained his father's bank account and wrote several fraudulent checks totaling almost 7,000 euros. Xavier had apparently joined a gun club at the end of 2010 and had been learning to shoot. After his father passed, he inherited a rifle and started practicing even more. Arthur and Thomas would occasionally accompany him to the shooting range, as did Emmanuel, who didn't seem overly concerned about Xavier's new hobby despite his recent threats. In February, Agnes wrote to a friend that her marriage was on the rocks. She said it had become, quote, rigid and quasi-military. In that note, she also made it clear she knew about Catherine and complained that Xavier had been a financial drain on her as well. On March 12th, Xavier bought a silencer and ammunition. Weeks later, on April 1st, he bought cement, lime, and a shovel and was going to the gun range multiple times a week, occasionally practicing with his new silencer. The family spent the day together on April 3rd, but Thomas left to go back to university at 5 p.m. The rest of the family went to see a movie at 6 o'clock, then they went to the Charolais Grill for dinner just after 8 p.m. The family's last actions can all be traced by the various digital conversations they were engaged in. Arthur was texting a girl he'd had an affair with and dodging calls from his girlfriend. Anne went to post about her day on Facebook, and Agnes texted a friend and went to bed. Xavier called a new woman he was having an affair with, also named Catherine, just after 10.30. He'd tried texting her as well, but she didn't pick up, so he left a voicemail asking her if she had time to talk. Arthur's last text to his lover went out at 11.08pm. Agnes texted her friend until 11.40. 
and messaged a friend for the last time at 12.24 a.m. Then the family's digital conversations went quiet for a while, hinting that they'd all gone to bed. All except one person. At 2.01 a.m., someone on the network was on a Catholic forum reading about mortal sins. Then, just a short time later, Agnes's sleep apnea machine shut down for good around 3.30. Xavier called the church Agnes volunteered at at 6 a.m. and told them she was ill. He called Arthur's University and told them he'd been in an accident. For the younger kids, he simply called the high school to tell them they were sick. Someone submitted a resignation letter that morning to the pizza place Arthur worked at. Meanwhile, Thomas was going about his day with no idea his family had been gunned down in their sleep the night before. He went to class, then choir practice. Afterwards, his friends invited him out for drinks, but he told them that his father had invited him out for dinner. They met for dinner just before 9 p.m., and Xavier ordered an expensive multi-course meal as if he were celebrating. Witnesses would later say Thomas seemed exceedingly tired at the restaurant, apparently almost falling asleep in the middle of dinner to the point he was drawing attention from multiple witnesses. Thomas fell asleep in the car and woke up confused, asking where they were going. Xavier dropped him off at his dorm and went home. The next day, Xavier sent an email to Veronique telling her about the family outing they had all had on Sunday, mentioning his dinner with Thomas, and then he casually talked about the weather as if nothing was wrong. At 7.18 p.m., Xavier called Thomas fabricating a story that Agnes had been in a terrible bicycle accident. He said she was in a coma and he needed to get home immediately. Thomas had to take the train back, so Xavier had some time to kill before his son got home. He went out to buy more wine and cleaning products. Xavier picked up Thomas from the train station, and the two got home just before midnight. One of Thomas's friends texted him several times for updates, and he said the last few messages sent from Thomas's phone did not sound like him. Then he stopped responding altogether. Neighbors would later recall the family dogs howling throughout the night around that time. Those following the case have theorized that Thomas was not killed the night of the initial slayings or the next night because Xavier hesitated to kill his heir. As his eldest biological son, Xavier might have favored him. After the family was dismembered, someone deleted numerous files from Xavier's computers and sporadically responded to texts and emails on the rest of the family's phones. Witnesses saw Xavier loading his car with heavy bags on April 7th. On the 8th and 9th, he cleared out the apartments of the older boys. Police were later able to establish a shaky trail of Xavier's whereabouts after he sent the letters on the 8th. He stayed in the house until the morning of the 10th. Then he started driving south towards the VAR region where he lived in the 90s. Police were easily able to trace his credit card usage. He used his real name when checking into hotels and made no attempts to hide his identity. On April 12th, Xavier stayed in a luxury hotel and witnesses claimed he seemed relaxed and aloof. He wore a fancy suit, bought expensive alcohol with his dinner, and seemed in generally good spirits. Police eventually found Xavier's car abandoned outside a Formula One hotel where he'd stayed the night of April 14th. He'd made it back to VAR almost 500 miles or 800 kilometers south of Nantes. A search of the Formula One hotel where Xavier was last spotted came up empty, but a surveillance video showed him leaving the parking lot on foot, carrying a suitcase. When the parking lot surveillance camera captured him for the last time, it was 4.10 p.m. on April 15th. On April 23rd, police issued an international search alert for Xavier. Sightings poured in. Xavier had dark hair and was of average height. He didn't have too many distinguishing characteristics, so people were calling in anyone who bore even a passing resemblance to him. Police were openly claiming Xavier as a suspect by then. Given the amount of planning that went into Xavier's killing spree, police were assuming he might be alive and dangerous. Local police questioned businesses and tourist spots and searched abandoned buildings. Multiple teams searched the wilderness in VAR for a body using search and rescue teams, divers, and cadaver dogs. Police also conducted intensive interviews, and a closer examination of those around him revealed some disturbing clues. Both Emmanuel and Michelle were caught telling lies to the police early on, and police started to wonder if one or both of the men might have helped Xavier plot his murders and escape. 
What led police to question Michel in the first place was the disturbing revelation that he'd been on a business trip in VAR from the 13th through the 15th, the same day Xavier was in the region. Though the men never officially crossed paths, they visited the same tourist attraction on the same day just hours apart and even emailed each other from their respective hotel rooms. Michel emailed Xavier to ask if he was okay, and Xavier responded pretending to be the DEA, saying that his phone was going to be shut off soon. Michel denied having any knowledge Xavier was there when questioned by the police. Police didn't get any kind of confession from Michel, and he maintained his innocence. The possibility that Emmanuel was an accomplice was brought to the police's attention because of the numerous lies he told. He denied going to Xavier's house on the 9th, but later admitted the truth. He said he didn't have any guns, and neither did Xavier, when in fact he had a rifle and a handgun. Emmanuel told police he hadn't been able to get a hold of Xavier since April 1st. However, on April 2nd, they talked for 43 minutes at different intervals. On April 5th, they talked for almost 20 minutes. The April 9th copy of the letters that Emmanuel received were not postmarked, so Xavier delivered them in person and they very well could have spoken that day. Police let Emmanuel go after initial questioning, but followed him closely with surveillance. In late July, when Michel was being questioned and Emmanuel was being followed, police also decided to look into the possibility that Xavier's family was hiding him. Though Veronique and Xavier got out of the cult after the 1994 scandal, Xavier had taken an interest again in 2009. Christine never left the cult. She tried to claim she didn't talk to Xavier often, but police found she had six different telephone lines and the two spoke all the time on various numbers. Also, her husband Bertram had sent Xavier 13,000 euros in the months leading up to the murders. On July 26th, police coordinated a massive search in cities all over France of the homes of all of the members of the Church of Philadelphia. They knocked on everyone's door at the same time so members couldn't alert each other. The most concerning findings were at Christine and Bertram's house. Police examined Genevieve's most recent writing, which read in part, quote, Have peace of mind about Xavier's fate. Know that he is happy with his fate in relation to the nightmare he left and that he lived so courageously. You should also know that Agnes and the children are doing well and adapting well to their new life. Police found over 13,000 euros in cash and the equivalent of over 6,000 euros in foreign currency. Much of the money was in envelopes sent to be mailed out. Some wire transfer receipts were found as well, and police concluded the family was sporadically sending money to a few religious radicals who supported their beliefs all over the globe. Though there were many who seemed suspicious, nothing concrete was ever found. In late 2012, police launched an in-depth search of the countryside near Roch brun sur argent the mountainous area where Xavier was last seen. They wanted to focus on caves of the abandoned potassium mines. Police at the time were considering that he had committed suicide, but were also open to the idea he was still on the run or even being hidden by family members. The searches didn't turn up anything and the case went cold. In 2015, someone had found human remains in the area where Xavier had vanished, but DNA would prove it wasn't him. Other sightings and dead ends followed. At one point, a man with a passing resemblance to Xavier was arrested and the media was quick to declare Xavier found, but it turned out to be a miscommunication between international police departments about fingerprint matching. Christine and Genevieve both maintained that Xavier was innocent and that the family did go into witness protection. Apparently, they were never allowed to view the bodies before they were cremated, so they think the murders were an elaborate hoax. But if that's the case, why wouldn't they just fake all of their deaths? It doesn't make sense. They also pointed out that Xavier had a bad back and wouldn't have been able to crouch under the porch and dig so many graves. Oh, well if you say so. Varani cut ties with most of her family after the 1994 scandal and moved to Africa. She kept up a bit with Xavier, and though she believes he's guilty, she's tried to understand what he did through the lens of his strange religious upbringing and the childhood trauma. She thinks that because their family struggled so much when Hubert abandoned them, that Xavier considered it better to kill his family than lead them to ruin. She thinks he went into the wilderness to commit suicide alone because he didn't want his devout Catholic family to know he'd committed a mortal sin. 
Michel committed suicide on March 2, 2018 after a battle with cancer. He had been looking through the photos of his years spent touring the U.S. with Xavier before he died. Emmanuel died on January 18, 2020, due largely to health complications caused by his excessive drinking. If either man had any additional information about what had happened, those secrets likely died with them. Whether Xavier is still alive or not is a mystery that has fascinated the French media. He certainly has the financial means. If his family's cult can afford to support numerous supporters all around the globe, they could support him. He has a generic enough face to blend in almost anywhere. In addition to his native French, he speaks English and Spanish. But the area Xavier vanished in, a mountainous forest filled with abandoned mines, might very well be able to conceal a body indefinitely if he had killed himself or died of exposure. Not to mention the sea being so close by. While the mystery of Xavier's whereabouts might never be answered, the mystery of what happened to his family seems to most likely be explained. Someone killed them in the middle of the night on October 4th, then shortly after that they killed Thomas. Xavier was in that house until the 10th. Someone had access to drug the entire family before bed on that fateful night in April. Someone sent out letters and phone calls and notes explaining why they all vanished, buying weeks before the bodies were found. Someone took the time to wrap each body in a burial shroud with their cherished possessions. Someone poured out a drink for the bodies and lit a candle under that house after they slaughtered the family. And unless some shocking new information comes to light, it seems very clear who that sinister someone was. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.